Today we're talking about March Madness, marching through the madness, and today we're talking about the home. Now I know that uh, uh, last week we were talking about the torch and talking about the Olympic theme. Today we're going to pass that torch off. And we're going to start something brand new. And in so many times in our homes we have problems. In our culture we have problems. Many single parents, couples, and even grandparents look at the future and say, what can we do to minister better to our kids and to learn what our kids are like? We go to a grocery store and we see kids throwing a temper tantrum. They're mad because they don't get a candy bar or a piece of gum. And we look at that and we see that and, and we look at that kid and sometimes we look at that kid and we don't blame the kid. Sometimes we look at the parents and say, why aren't you stopping the kid? So often we look at our lives and our lives are in chaos. And today in our culture, the priority is to make our kid feel worthy. And sometimes we have to punish and discipline. Sometimes we cannot allow our kids just to have everything that they want. So I want to show you some families and see which family that you would represent. If you were this family, which one do you closely associate yourself with? The first one is Roseanne. The Connors often struggle with money. The house was always messy, and they didn't always do or say the right thing. Somebody say an amen to that one? Amen. All right. But the next one is the Brady Bunch. The Bradys were a large, blended family. There were always awkward adjustments, accommodations, gender rivalries, and resentment in errant and blended families. But she said something one time. There are no steps in our home except for the ones going upstairs. We are one family, not two. And I think that was really good, the Brady Bunch. How many of you guys relate to the Brady Bunch? Blended families. We all have those blended families. But what about leave it to Beaver? When the boys got, and this is, you know, how many of you, you're going to lie if this is you. When the boys got home from school, mom would be in the kitchen, neatly dressed with pearls in her hair, immaculate cooking dinner. Dad worked hard. And when they went to church every Sunday, and they always ate dinner together at the table. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have any Brady's, do we? What about the Biddle? The Hex are two income family. The parents get cranky and they face the day and the crisis that rises every day. The kids are living in paycheck to paycheck and it struggles. How many of you guys are like the middle? We always do. And then this is most of you. The Simpsons. The Simpsons have a lack of family values, but somehow they're wacky with thinking and they bind them together. Sometimes we are like the Simpsons. We have sometimes some character flaws and Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it stresses us out. Despite of our greatest intentions, we don't have the ultimate control over how our kids respond in our homes. There are some things that we can increase on our influence and some things that we can sabotage it. What are those things that sabotage your relationship with your kids? What are the specific actions that you do that they won't follow in a crisis? Let me give you some ideas. Number one is you discipline in anger. You yell. Sometimes we are too controlling or overzealous or that we look at our glory days and expect our kids to live up to what we did and so we force them to do the things that we did and sometimes they don't want to do what we did and we burn them out. What about your regrets? You made a failure. So you want to make sure your kids don't have that same failure. So you put guidelines and instructions on your kids. Instead of allowing your kids to train up a child in the way he should go, the bent that he has, has to be the way that I want it to do. But sometimes it's negativity. Sometimes we are negative to our kids. Sometimes that they do something wrong. Instead of affirming them in what they do right, we are negative about what they do. So in your bulletin, I want you to do something. I want you to write down three things that your children do wrong. Just write them down. Three things that your children do wrong that just frustrates you. Just frustrates you. It shouldn't be too hard to figure those things out. If you're a grandparent, you can say that with about your grandkids. Three things that your child does wrong. But then right beside that, three things that your child does wonderfully. 
three things that your child does wonderfully. Now, in your parenting, what do you focus on the most? Do you focus on what they do wrong? Or do you affirm them in what they did right? Because most kids' self-esteem is what their parents communicate to them and affirm them in. Think about what you can do for them. Pat them on the back. Let them know that they are loved. Oh, I do believe in discipline, but I also believe in affirmation. Then after you go back and look at that, I want you to have, if you would be honest with your kids, and say, you know what? Let me tell you, face to face, what you do that is awesome. And let me tell you what will take place in that kid's face. A smile will come across his face. Because mom and dad affirm me. They love me. If all we do with our kids is become negative and yell and scream and tell them everything that they're doing wrong, guess what those kids are going to do? Everything wrong. But if we affirm them and lift them up and inspire them to do something great, things will happen. Think about how your kids think you'll feel about them. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, do not withhold good from those whom you is due when it is the power to do so. Don't, don't withhold positive instructions to them. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. A good report, a good report. When somebody does something in your family that's right, that's positive, reaffirm them. Love them and help them. But I want to give you a devastating myth and a frustrating truth. A devastating myth. I wish this myth was absolutely true, but unfortunately, it makes for a good sermon, but it doesn't make good application. Here's the myth. Godly homes guarantee you godly kids. If I pray with my kids or pray for my kids, my kids will never do anything wrong. My kids will never stay out too late. My kid will never do anything that they should not do because I am godly and I have a godly home and we pray for each other. My kids are going to be perfect. How did that work out for all of us? It doesn't work out, does it? Our kids are going to make mistakes. We can give them a godly influence, but we can't guarantee them that they'll be godly. Every person has to make those decisions for themselves. But what we do have is we have that influence. So here's the truth. We have no control, but we have tons of influence. We cannot make our kids do anything when we're not around them, can we? Could your parents? <laughs> Let's be honest. We did what we want to do when mom and dad wasn't around. And our kids are going to do what they want to do when we're not around. So we have no control over what they do. But we have tons of influence on what we need to do and how we can live our lives in front of them. Influence. This sermon today on parenting is about influence. If you don't have kids in your home, think about somebody that you're trying to influence. and somebody you're going to try to live a godly life in front of. So you can use these same criteria to people in your homes or people at your office. But we have to have influence in people's lives. I want to read a proverb to you. This is not a promise. This is a proverb. A proverb is something that should take place. Solomon's idea of what should take place. It is not a guarantee. A promise that Jesus gives to us is con concrete. It will never change. But a proverb is something that in generalities they would take place. And in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 it says, Train up a child in the way they should go. And when he is old he will not depart from it. Many years ago, I heard the sermon on this scripture, and it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and before he dies, he will come back to what you've trained him in. And I wish that was true. But I've seen so many kids grown up in church that were preached to, that went wayward, but they never came back to the church. And I wish it was true that if we do everything we need to for our kids, they will always follow Jesus. They will never do anything wrong. But unfortunately, that's a proverb. In generalities, it may be true. But in actuality, not always will our kids respond the way that we want them to respond. But in everything, we have to love our kids. 
Even when they're doing something wrong, we need to love those kids. We need to honor those kids. We need to have influence over those kids. But one day you're going to stand before God. And one day they're going to stand before God. And we are not going to hold a, be accountable to what they have done. We're going to be accountable to what we have done. And the influence that we live our lives in. Not necessarily because they have done something wrong. They will always do something wrong. Just like you have always done something wrong. Just like I've always done something wrong. My parents are not going to stand up and say, you didn't do this. I was a perfect kid growing up. So my parents would never have to worry about that. But I've never, ever done anything that they didn't want me to do. But you know what? They don't have to stand up to heaven and say, let me tell you what your son did. What they're going to have to stand up in heaven and say, this is what I did. I loved them. I prayed for them. I encouraged them. I gave them influence. But when they walk out that door, when mom and dad is not around, when they're out with their friends, those decisions that they make are under their control, not under your control. In Proverbs chapter 21, verses 30 through 31, it says this. There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is the Lord's. Well, what does all that mean? He's just saying this. He's saying, your job in battle is to prepare. You have to prepare your horse for battle. And when you prepare your horse for battle, you have a good chance of winning. But if you do not prepare your horse, if you do not prepare your child for battle, he may not win. But ultimately, everything that we do is under the hand of God. Preparation is key. It is the key for everything that we do. So I want to give you four very simple ideas that are biblical for raising and training your child. Now many of you don't have kids yet. But you know what? Every child and every parent would say, I wish I'd have known that 20 years ago. Tammy Letourneau just said this to me. Where's Tammy at? Ta raise your hand. Tammy Letourneau and, and <laughs> she just said this to me. She goes, I wish I'd have known this 20 years ago. My kids would have been so much better than they are now. <laughs> Give me a five. Hi. There you go. All right. But here they are. The idea is this, is information with instruction has transformation. Just because we know it, but we don't do it, is not going to change anybody's lives. But the idea of parenting is we don't have parenting classes when we're 20 years old and we have our two or three kids. We're walking in this saying, this is what my dad did, this is what my mom did, so that's what they did, so that's what I'm going to do. And I would ask, how'd that work out for you? Because sometimes we end up being just like our moms or just like our dads because that's all we know. But we do not need to be like our moms or like our dads because we have a Bible that communicates exactly what we need to do. I'm not saying that we need to change everything that your mom and your dad did because some of you have great moms and dads. And they're here, so I have to say that. <laughs> but some of you have very dysfunctional families that you came from. And you don't want to be like your mom and your dad. But the older you get, the more that you become like your mom and your dad. But one thing that we need to become like is what the Christ said in the Word of God. So I'm going to give you four simple principles. I want to give some applications to you. Model respect for authority. Model respect for authority. God has asked us to do things that we don't really want to do. Sometimes we think it's spiritually unfair but when God doesn't make sense, we don't go on our way, we don't pout, and we don't cry. Sometimes we have to do what he wants us to do. Model authority and respect authority. Whether it's you use March Madness mindset and you see kids playing basketball and they get a foul called on them. It's the universal sign of a frustration. What? I didn't do that. Why? What are you talking about? Well, the referee called a foul, and guess what? You're not going to change his mind. He's not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't foul. No, you fouled, and here is the punishment. The ball's theirs. In basketball, a referee calls a foul. The instantaneous punishment is it's the other team's ball. In our life, our kids make a mistake. Sometimes we're afraid to call the foul because my child may not feel worthy. So our kids are so used to not doing anything wrong because moms and dads don't call them out. 
What we need to do is have them respect authority. Understand punishment. They get a bad grade in school. <laughs> Any of your kids ever get bad grades in school? What our society does now, moms and dads, we go jump on the teacher's face because you give my kid a bad grade. Well, maybe, just maybe, your kid didn't turn in that paper. Your kid may have lied to you and said, I did turn that paper in. But what we do, because our kids are perfect, right? We believe our child instead of believing the teacher. And because we believe the child instead of the teacher, we get mad at the teacher and call the teacher names in front of our kids. So what happens to our kids when they go to school the next day? That's what mom did. I can say anything I want. Mom called her the, that name. So I can call her that name. But what we need to do more than anything else is model respect for authority. Proverbs chapter 24. My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those given to change. For their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin those can bring. We need to respect those in authority. Respect those in authority. The second thing, put character over performance. We think our parents' performances create what we do for our, our kids, create character. Sometimes we think our kid should be the all-star. And because they got set on the bench instead of started, we get mad at the coach. And sometimes we understand that my character is more important than my performance. I'm going to step on a couple people's toes here, so I'm going to do it anyway. We care more about, we talk more about how to play sports than we do how to love God. I just walked, drove by soccer fields over here on 47th Street. Did you see all the cars out there at the soccer fields? Hundreds and hundreds of cars on the soccer field. And I'm not anything wrong. So I, my boy played basketball on Sunday, so, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong. But I'm saying what we need to do is we need to teach our kids more about God than we do about soccer. More about God than we do about basketball. And sometimes our kids do great at sports. And we lift them up and affirm them in sports or in athletics or in music. But they're very ignorant about God. And not too many of those guys are going to play in the NBA. Not too many of those basketball players are going to get full rides at KU, Wichita State, or K-State. Well, KU they probably would because they, <laughs> they don't need good ball players anyway. I'm just, last week, I was just watching last night's games. All I was, that's all I'm saying. But we care, we, we care more about their success in the world than we do about their success spiritually. But it all boils down to this. One day, one day, it's not going to be important if they can make a basketball or not. If they can kick a goal or not. One day what's going to be very important is if they know Jesus Christ or not. And as parents, our biggest goal is to let them honor Christ. We should care more about what the child is doing than what he or she thinks. We need to be, are they kind to others? Do they love others? What is in their heart is what's important. I used this scripture last week and I think it's so important to us. 1 Samuel chapter 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or the physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see a man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. The character. We need to take our kids and we need to train them and we need to discipline to have character within their life. It's our job to influence them. What good would it be? To be honest with you, I know, I know that we want this with, for our kids. And I'd love for this for my kids. But I want this secondary for my kids. What would it be if our kid had all the money, all the prestige in the world, but they don't know God? The Bible says it this way in Luke chapter 9. For what profit of the man if he gains the whole world and himself is destroyed at the last day? What good would it be? We have these 70 years or in a basketball career or football career. You're playing maybe 15 years. And after that, you're done. 
What good would it be is if you gained the entire world, had all the resources, had all the influence in the world, but one day you have a heart attack, you have a stroke, and you die without Christ. What good is it? What good is it? This basketball over here is a friend of mine. She gave this to me. I think it was even in church she gave it to her. Her name's Jackie Stiles. Anybody know Jackie Stiles? Jackie Stiles was Brett's basketball instructor. And she uh, used to hold the record for the NCAA women's basketball uh, total points scored in a complete uh, career. So she gave me this. I even had her on the platform and uh, she gave her testimony here a few, a few years ago. But Jackie Stiles, just last month, came down with cancer. And cancer of the eyes. And there's a good chance that she may go blind. I'd say, what good is it to have all the popularity, to have everything that you can have, but not have Christ? You know, we're a heartbeat away. We're a doctor's appointment away of thinking everything's not okay. But what we can say is everything can be okay. It makes no difference about my health or my wealth. What makes a difference? Do I know Christ and do I share my love for Jesus Christ to others around the world? You know, we've been praying for her. Uh, I, as soon as we came up with the information, I called Brett and, uh, and Brett gave her a text and was talking to her. She has a positive role model. She lives in Springfield. She's the assistant coach out at uh, Southwest Missouri State University in Springfield. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Parents, in everything that we do, the devotions that we have, the love that we have, our biggest, most awesome responsibility is to make sure each and every one of our kids or grandkids know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It makes no difference if they start on the basketball team, start on the soccer team, gymnastics. That makes no difference. What makes a difference in the big picture is that they have a passion and love for Jesus Christ. And the third thing, take a genuine interest in the world. Take a genuine interest in the world. Now, I have two kids. And opposites, big time. And, and they're not here, so I'm going to be honest with them. I would, I would leave early to go watch Brett's basketball game. I was in 10. I coached his basketball team. Now, there's people in here that I coached them on their basketball team because Brett had friends that I coached their team and we had upper, soccer, upper basketball here. We did everything for them. So I was genuinely interested in Brett's career, in his athletics, because I could relate to that. But then, I have Bryson. I don't understand music. I don't even really care to know music. And when they said, oh, Brett has a concert tonight. Oh. <laughs> I think I have counseling. I think I have, but I would get there and I'd sit on the front row <laughs> and I would smile. I would love him. Did I enjoy that? No way. <laughs> Let me tell you the difference though. We just went to his concert from Fort Hay State University last week, there's a big difference between college concerts and junior high concerts. <laughs> I said, oh my Lord, why would you even go to a concert? But then you get to college and it's like, oh wow, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, good job. I'll go to another concert when they're not like, oh my Lord. I mean, those things you go through sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and I'm like, when are you ever going to quit? <laughs> but you know what? You never stop. What's more important than what they sound like is that mom and dad support them in everything that they do. Even if they sit on the bench and they get in at the bottom of the ninth inning after the team is up by 20 points, <laughs> you still applaud them. And on the way home, you don't tell them what they did wrong. You tell them what they did right. Because if on the way home, they, had, they went three for four, but they struck out one time. You know what mom and dad do? We get our identity out and say, why didn't you hit that fastball? 
Why'd you strike out? Well, Dad, I hit a home run, I hit a triple. Well, yeah, but you struck out. Man, you need to work harder. And all of a sudden, that kid's demeanor is shrunk because mom and dad didn't focus on the positive. They focused on the negative. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for their own interest, but the interest of others. The esteem of others. So, church, moms, and dads, how do we esteem somebody? Esteem means let's look for the positive and let's lift them up. Let's encourage them. Let's not beat them down. Because our kids, ready for this? Our kids are going to emulate you. And how you treat your kids, most, this is a proverb, it's not a promise, is most likely how they are going to treat their kids. And sometimes you're going to go to your grandkids' baseball game. And their dad, your son, or your daughter, will be at the fence and they'll be yelling at them because you were at the fence yelling at them. Because that's what mom and dad did. That's what I do. But here's what we need to do. We need to esteem them. And then when we esteem them, we need to bring everything back to a biblical principle. The highest priority is not what they do on the baseball diamond, on the basketball court, or on the soccer field. Those are fun things, and they need to do that. It teaches great character. But we need to teach them about Jesus Christ. But here's the big one that I think I failed at. And probably we fail that. Is sometimes we need to pick your battles. Somebody say me an amen on that one? Sometimes, just because it's a pet peeve of mine, I have to jump on my kids because I don't like what they did. But what they did was nothing wrong. It's just I didn't like it. Clean your room. Do the dishes. You know, sometimes we need to pick our battles. And sometimes, picking our battles, we have to fix ourselves before we can fix them. Such as this. Clean your room. Well, Mom, Dad, your room's a mess. <laughs> Somebody give me an amen on that one, right? Amen. You do the dishes. Well, Mom, Dad, you don't ever do the dishes. Why don't you mow the yard? Well, the yard looks like crap all the time so why do I have to mow the yard sometimes what we have to do is to train them on what they need to do and sometimes in training it's not what we tell them it's what we show them and if we do not show them properly what we are doing is we're making a major mistake they don't have the same personality we need to admonish them to be who they need to be is this really important? Is this is the battle that we want to fight? Is it just your opinion? Or is it your personality? If it is, sometimes we have to say, I'm going to let it go. I have two boys. And both of my boys are, what's that word? Slobs. <laughs> Ashley goes, don't you ever pick up after yourself. And you know what Brett would say? I'm my daddy's son. <laughs> That's exactly what he would say because I'm kind of a slob too. Okay. So Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Do not cause them fear, but train them. And sometimes we train them on what we don't like, but what we have to do is train them in who they are. I, I use this analogy all the time, and I want to use it one, one more time because we're talking about sports. Our kids are given to you by God, and you are the coach. And those kids do not know anything. You can tell kids that come into sports where dads and moms played with them and taught them how to dribble and taught them how to shoot, taught them how to do certain things. Or you can go into a coach and say, here's my kid. 
they've never even held a basketball before. And they're, and they're trying to play basketball. I don't know where basketball is. So they're trying to play this game. And they don't know how to shoot. You know. So the coaches say, here, this is a ball. And other kids are up there do, you know, doing all kinds of things, making baskets. Like, I was thinking I'm 0 for 2. I told myself I was going to make one of those baskets, but I didn't. But the coach has this. He says, my job is to teach your child or my child how to play basketball before the first game. And the idea is this. I do not want my child to be embarrassed on the basketball court. They need to know what the free throw line is. They need to know what the out of bounds line is. They need to know what a foul is. They need to know what a three second call is. They don't know. And parents, would you say the coach's job is to teach the kid how to play basketball? That's why you get paid to play coach. Parents, Jesus is saying this to us. Train up your child. Do not let the schools train your child. Do not let the church train your child. You train your child how to play the game of life. And when he is 18 years old, 35, 40, when he gets out of the house, you have done, <laughs> you finally got the, you've done your job, you hand him the basketball and say, it's your game. Coach, you stand on the sideline and you watch. You watch. And sometimes at halftime, we may have to do some instructions. We may have to say, I need to do some tweaking here. Sometimes we have to have some motivation. But you know what? A coach has the right to keep the player in the game or out of the game. To instruct him in what he needs to do or to affirm him. And every person, including me, there's times that I have to be disciplined by God. There's also times that he esteems me. There's times that he honors me. And every child of God is disciplined and is esteemed. Every child that you have, there's times that we need to discipline them because they do not know what they're doing. We need to train them. And once they've turned from the discipline to the training and they finally get it, what do we do? We have to esteem them. We have to lift them up. We can't just say, well, you need to do that better. You need to do that better. You need to do that better. Sooner or later, we need to say, okay, if he can't do that, there's something else he should be doing. But we need to esteem our kids our grandkids in a wonderful way. Because what ultimately we want is we want our kids to love God. We want our kids to honor to God. Passing the torch is very important. It's a parent's job to pass the torch from my dad to me. From you to your son or to your daughter. In light of that, I'd like to ask you a question. What is one thing that your mom and your dad did wonderfully in training you. What is something they did that you say, you know what, I want to look at my mom and dad, and if I could talk to them, if they are still alive, I'd say, Mom, Dad, thank you. You taught me well. I went to see my mom this week in Wamego, and she's got dementia, and she's going downhill in a, in a hurry. And, um, I just sit and talk to her. It's about a 10 minute conversation 20 times, but um, it, it, was, it, was, it was very unique. Very sobering. And um, I just had a good talk with her. And I said, thanks, Mom. She goes, she goes you sure have white hair now. I said, Mom, I've had white hair since I'm 30 years old. And she, she looked at my belly. She goes, ooh, you're gaining weight. <laughs> like a What's that guy's name? Michelin Man or whatever it is. I said, oh man. But you know what? For her to remember that I had white hair, that I was getting chubby, I could care less what she said to me. I just care that she's still alive and I have her around. We need to be honoring to our parents. We need to love our parents. Because here's the thing. The way that our kids see us honor our parents, ready for this, is the way that they are going to honor us. I text Brett. He lives in Kansas City. I said, I'm going to go see your grandmother today. He goes, oh, 
He goes, if I was off work, I'd love to come down and meet her. I said, sometime you ought to just go down there and see her anyway. He goes, we'll do that. Because we need to teach our kids that mom and dad, they deserve, they have earned our respect. And we need to let our kids know that I respect my mom and I respect my dad. Because one day, you're going to be in a nursing home. And what do you want? You want your kids to come visit you. You want your kids to honor you. And here's what we do in Psalms chapter 119. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your words. And sometimes we need to remember what mom and dad said. Because one day, your kids or your great grandkids are going to graduate from high school. And they're going to start a career. They may go in banking or athletics, go to spirit and work. Who knows what they're going to do? But one thing that you have to say is this. I've done my job. And when you've done your job, you can walk away and say, it's yours. You have to have confidence that you've done your job. Now, there's many times that being a godly home does not guarantee a godly kid. Somebody give me an amen on that. But what you can do, I've done my best. I've practiced. I've trained. I've equipped. I have loved. Now the ball is in your court. You can still love them. Help them and encourage them. But the chaos in the home, the madness of the home, is when the coach doesn't train. And the kids don't know what they're doing. Have you ever seen little, little kindergartens, uh, baseball team, t-ball team? They're like little cats, wherever the ball is, everybody goes and go, whoa, 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 no. When the ball's over here, the third baseman picks it up. Not the shortstop. And the ball's here, the second baseman picks it up. The first baseman don't pick up a shortstop's ball. But they try to follow every place where the ball goes. And you have to call time out. And you have to train your child in the game of life. One thing that uh, um, I think our kids do not know, because sometimes our parents do not know, is finances. Is debt. My boy's 20 years old right now. And do you know how many credit card applications he gets in the mail? Wow. Bunches. <laughs> and it's very easy for him to sign his name and get a five or $10,000 credit card. And to a college kid, woohoo! Party time! For three months. And then they're saying, well, I got to pay this bill. I got to get a job. Because credit card company doesn't care whether you have a job or not. They just want their money. So we need to train our kids every aspect. And finances is one of the aspects that we have to train our kids. We have to love our kids enough that they are not in chaos. Let me ask, how many of you guys, this is authenticity here, how many of you guys have ever had credit card problems? Raise your hand. How many of your parents, your parents had debt problems when they were growing up? Raise your hand. Okay. It is a learned behavior that we can change if we're honest with our kids, fight our battles, and love our kids, and let them know that we love them. So my challenge today in this invitation, in marching through the madness, are your kids important to you? It's not about teaching them basketball or soccer. It's about teaching them about God. And the one thing that we need to do is we need to pray for our kids. We need to pray for them. We need to love them. We need to teach them things because they are the heart of our life. There are more tears spent after our kids going wayward than anything else. And the only way that we'll change what our kids are doing is pray for them. So I want to give you a challenge. Pray for our kids. Pray for your kids. And we're going to give an opportunity for the next five minutes. The altars are going to be open. And there's something about the heartbeat of God is when you call out your kid's name. I want to pray for Brett. I pray that he does this right. I pray that he is honored. Pray for Bryson and call their name out loud to God. And what God does, he listens to your heart. 
And he allows the very prayers that we utter to God to allow him to move into the work in people's lives. Pray. If we are not willing to pray for our kids, we don't have a game plan for God to work within their lives. And God instructs us through the word of God and through prayer. You need to pray for your kids daily. You need to pray with your kids daily. You need to honor God because God gave to you the very desires of your heart and that your kids love them. Be positive. Affirm them and lift them up. And if you're a student, you need to pray for your parents. You need to pray for your kids that you will have. I prayed for since Brett was like five and Bryson was like five years old, I've been praying for their spouses, praying that God will give them the very desires of their heart. So we need to start praying for our kids and their spouses. We need to pray for their life. We need to pray for their, their honor and their character. Not, I hope they make the baseball team. I hope, I hope they start this Sunday. We need to have a bigger picture than that. I pray, Lord that my kids honor you. I pray that they follow after you. I pray that they give their life to you. Those are game-changing prayers. Don't stop praying for your kids. I don't care if your kids are 40 years old. They're still making mistakes. And they still need your prayers. Whether your kid are one or your kid is 40 years old, honor them with prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and ask you to make your way down here and call out your kid's name and ask God to bless them. And if your kid is struggling, is going wayward, do not be afraid to call God and say, I need your help. I've done everything I could possibly do, and I have failed. But Lord, I know that you will never fail. I need you to take over in my kid's life, to love my kid, to help my kid, instruct my kid, put a protection around my child, and put somebody in their life that will come in to minister to them, to instruct them, to be the person that they need to change what they do. God is the only person that can protect your child. You need to ask God to do that. So let's come to the altar and let's pray for our kids at this time.